Hey everybody, uh, I'm John Havens. I'm new here at Porto Novelli. I'm the VP of social media. Very excited. Woohoo! And uh, also very excited to have uh, Jim Louder back, who is CEO of uh, Revision 3. And uh, I've been friends with Jim uh, through the Association of Downloadable Media for about a year and a half, and he's definitely a leader in the social media movement in circles, and we're thrilled to have him with us today. So thanks for coming. It's great to be here. Thank right. you. Hey, why don't you grab here. a seat? All right, cool. Get cozy. You got your coffee? I got my coffee. Nine o'clock New York time, and I'm from California. <laughs> so, so what do you guys want? How do you guys want to? Oh, I think. Why don't you tell us a little about? Because you know I can talk for an hour. Yeah. So, so <laughs> you may not want that. <laughs> so, why don't you tell us a little about Revision Three? I know what sure. you guys do, but tell us. So, Revision Three is basically a television network for the internet. Uh, we are, um, but the the similarities between television and what we do. Uh, stop there. I mean, if you think, yes, we're video, yes, we're episodic, we produce 17 shows right now, going to 22 by the end of uh, November, um, they're all weekly or daily. Um, but it would be wrong to think of it as just TV on the internet. And um, because it's, I, we really look at it as a new medium. So it is um, a new way to reach people and communicate. And so if you think about traditional television, you know, the Jay Leno show or, um, you know, or, or Lost or 24, very expensive to produce, very high quality, uh, very um, you know, expensive to produce. Um, and uh, just having a, a sort of a sense of, you know, there's a, an hour long or a half hour long show. These shows have certain, the, they have their, um, their arc, they have their, you know, their, they have their A block, their B block, their C block, basically making sure that they can get 22 minutes of commercials in an hour. What we do is very different. We look at it as, it's more of a, um, if you think of television as a, you know, they're talking to me, what we try and do is make it much more of an interactive thing. So, um, you know, think about it. If you ran into Jimmy Fallon on the street, what would you do? You know, or, or, or Jay Leno or something like that. You'd be like, wow, it's Jay Leno. I mean, I remember meeting Jimmy Fallon. I was like, hi. What we really strive for is rather than having these stars who are unapproachable, is having hosts of our shows who are experts about the subject matter that we do. So the 17 shows are all nonfiction. There are no scripted shows. They're not comedies or dramas or anything like that, which we'll change in a minute, and I'll get to it. Um, but really, they're about the things that our, our, our audience is passionate about. We're laser focused on the sort of millennial male audience, so it's 30 and under, 34 and under. These are the ones who are, in many cases, abandoning traditional media. They're not reading newspapers as much. They're not watching as much television. They're not listening to radio as much. They're basically living their lives out on the internet. They're socializing, getting their entertainment, their information, and everything via, whether it's their notebook computer, just delivered via the internet, whether it's a handheld or a notebook or anything else. And so the shows we do appeal to the things that they love. So we have shows about what's going on in comic books. And so the, you know, the top comic book show out there we have a show about technology. And uh, the genesis of the company was um, I was on the launch team of a cable network called ZDTV, which turned into Tech TV, uh, which really was a 24-hour cable channel all about technology, computers, and the internet. It was a great idea. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't a great enough idea to be profitable as a cable network. Because as a cable network, you have 100 people just in the studio. We built a $30 million studio. When we wanted to do a show like Screensavers, which you know, um, we'd have two hosts who, you know, it was a real breakthrough. The hosts actually knew what they were talking about and were responsible for a lot of the content of the show. But we had producers, and we had associate producers, and we had associate associate producers, and we had directors, and technical directors, and, and floor directors, and 12 camera people. And anyway, it was expensive to produce. And we were doing low cost content. What we're doing now is taking some of those same uh, attributes, which are people who host that really connect to an audience because they're experts. You like technology, you like comic books, you like making movies. These are the hosts that you want to spend time with every week because they're talking about the stuff that you love and they're doing it in this engaging, personable way where it's not so much a fan base, but a friend base. It's a group of, of people who come in and want to watch this and be part of it because I just want to hang out with these hosts that are just their friends and tell them about cool stuff. Now, um, and we are capable of doing that not with 10 people in the control room and 20 people on the floor and four really expensive, high-priced talent with uh, agents from LA. We can do this with production teams with two or three people. 
hosts that are so into the content that they write all the content. And um, we built an internet streaming studio out in California that we can run with one or two people. So, and by the way, when you're in San Francisco, come over, happy to show it to you. We can stream live in HD to the world. Um, the other thing that's happened is that um, Moore's Law applies to pretty much everything in the video production business except for the pedestals that we stick our cameras on because hand-built Italian pedestals aren't covered by Moore's Law. What that means, though, is that the cost of producing everything is also a lot less expensive. So when we built ZDTV, we spent $30 million on the studio. We had these great, avid um, edit stations where you know, it's like $200,000 worth of technology, some silicon graphics and monitors that were this big that probably cost 20,000 bucks. Well, anybody who's been to Costco recently knows how much flat screen monitors are. And we do all our editing on Final Cut Pro with, uh, on a Mac. So what I, I like to say that you, know, you used to have to hire um, really expensive people to put your edit stations together. Now you can put them together at Fry's or CompUSA, and it's really true. Uh, and do stuff that's as good or better. We're all HD. Um, and uh, so just to kind of summarize, it shows about things that people love, that our, our audience, we super serve this 18 to 34-year-old male audience. We um, talk to them about their passions, and the audience connects to these hosts as if they were their friends. And when they do that, there is this amplification effect across social networks online that is amazing. So one of our shows, Dig Nation, um, the company was founded by the same guys who founded Dig, Kevin Rose, and a couple others, and in fact, they'd worked for me at ZDTV. Uh, and um, you know, Revision 3 was a separate company, still is a separate company. We do a show, Dig Nation, which basically has Kevin Rose and Alex Albrecht sitting on a couch, drinking beer, talking about the top stories on Dig. Yes, it sounds a lot like Wayne's World, um, <laughs> because it is. Um, but what it really is, and it's a little bit more highly produced than that, but it's a buddy movie. I mean, why was Wayne's World such a good movie? Because you put those two guys on a couch, and they hang out, and they drive at a pacer, and they're hilarious. Same thing with Kevin and Alex. They are really, it's just, you want to hang out with the two of them because you know it's going to be a fun 45 minutes when they're talking about those stories and you'll laugh and you'll cry and you know, you'll spit beer out your nose. I don't know. Anyway, that's kind of the essence of that show. And um, you know, it's, it's this tremendous show. But when, when we bring sponsors into our shows, we run pre-rolls and post-rolls and all that. But the real thing that, that real way we monetize all of our shows we have sponsors of the shows, and we bring them into the show. So the hosts, you know, they'll go through, they'll do, do their shows. Like, no, it's time to talk to our sponsors. You know, I want to thank our sponsor, Kraft, makes the best Philadelphia cream cheese ever. And, you know, Kevin might do something st silly like wiping it on his MacBook and licking it off or something. But that sort of interaction with products and brands and services really is extremely effective, um, not only because you don't want to fast forward it because you never know what Kevin's going to do with the Kraft cream cheese, but um, it really provides a connection between brand and you trade on the expertise that these hosts have to really drive connections between brands and audience to the point, and the amplification effect of that is immense. So in the old days, you guys know this, you, know, you tell somebody they love your product, they'll tell five or 10 friends. Well, with our audience, our average number of followers for each audience member on Twitter is 100. Each one has around 100 Facebook followers. And when they tweet out, watching Dignation, Kevin's getting drunk on Patron on the Patron train and eating a Klondike bar, I want one. By the way, that is an actual tweet. You can look it up. Um, that goes out to hundreds of people. So the, the, the show itself, about 200,000 people watch it. But the amplification effect of what happens in this conversation is immeasurable. So translating on the power that the hosts have with their audience, basically a friend base, and bringing brands in, has tremendous effect. And the smart brands that have taken advantage of that have seen great lift.